because a lot of what this presentation is about is if you don't generally have the resources, whether it's financial or capacity, to do disaster recovery for even if it's just one server, you know, I, I bet you have for your personal website, your company's web, you know, web server, um, this kind of plan will actually be financially plausible for most people to enact and have disaster recovery when you might otherwise not be able to afford it. Um, so, I'm going to get through the me slide just in case, and I, I realize none of you guys actually know me very well, so uh, if anyone see me at, uh, I know you saw me at uh, PingCon, okay. anyone else make any contact at PingCon? I wanted to, just that there's always three things going at the same time. Or nine things there, yeah. So, uh, so um, I'm a Linux admin, 24-7. Uh, I was answering some pages actually on my way here. And uh, working in Monroe for a managed service provider, MNX Solutions. So we do everything from uh, you know general architecture, day-to-day, 24-7 -day, monitoring, uh, security audits, implementations, um, whatever. So kind of, uh, kind of see it all. Um, Recently, the last two years, uh, I built a curriculum at uh, Eastern Michigan University. I was teaching the two links courses that they offer there. Um, so that's been, a, been an interesting uh, thing to do. Um, the, the cloud stuff started when I, when I was at E-Prize. Uh, E-Prize is out in Pleasant, Pleasant Ridge, right next to Royal Oak. And digital promotions. So what had happened is every year they had had one or two Super Bowl promotions. So two years ago was when I kind of did this architecture for the cloud. and. Uh, anyone remember the, uh, the Docker's commercial with people running in the field and no pants, that whole thing? And, yeah. Uh, so there was that one, and then Denny's every year obviously does like a free grand slam for a year type, you know, deal. So where we where we fall in is the go to this website to win a million dollars type. You know, we're the website where you win a million dollars. And you know, obviously during the Super Bowl, numbers of people hitting your website a little bit more hefty than a, a day to day type operation, and failing with that much money behind a commercial isn't really acceptable, generally speaking. So in previous years, there had been downtime, there had been um, failure scenarios with different cloud or with different Super Bowl promotions and other promotions. There would be a big advertising push. So when I actually started there, uh, you know, 2009, they had wanted to kind of plan for failure and assume that the infrastructure that they had, you know, in our data centers wouldn't handle the, the load of two promotions at the same time. Uh, you know, previous years, I mean, four million hits in under an hour is about a normal Super Bowl for one promotion. Multiply that, and you can see there's kind of a problem there in managing load, unless you, you know, buy a bunch of new hardware, blow your CapEx budget for the entire year, throw it all on a rack that you'll never use until next, you know, next year. It's kind of a, a cloud computing promise. You can get service, or resources on demand, for that little you know niche type situation, and then not have to pay for it all year. So that's how kind of how I got started. Um, I'm really involved in information security. There's actually a cloud security alliance. Uh, some you know some of the I'd say bigger names like a, like a Chris Hoff who runs Cisco's cloud computing security. Uh, you know some other Alex Hutton and some other uh, big names for security. And uh, they actually have a I'll call it a certification. It's kind of a generalized knowledge set that you understand cloud, cloud computing security needs a little bit more than maybe someone else. Uh, it's kind of kind of broad. Uh, and then my, we'll call it passion, is uh, configuration management puppet, like I gave at uh, you know, a lot of different conferences. But um, configuration management scalability, the one thing I say at most presentations about whether it's puppet or the cloud, and I'll just throw it out here even though it's not directly related, is cloud computing in its proper form is great. Infrastructure as a service, which is what you usually think of like the Amazon EC2, the Rackspace cloud type implementations, unless you can deploy it, scale it, and get rid of it without human intervention, cloud computing means nothing, right? You know, if I can rack a box in two hours, it, that doesn't make cloud computing better. The, the promise of cloud computing, the, the good part of cloud computing, is that it's instant, it's on demand, there's no, you know, there's no tech in a, you know, a data center that has to plug some Ethernet cables in for me to buy something. Um, so, this whole topic today is really about having that leveraged ability that you don't have to interact, that you can have resources and deploy something almost instantly. Um, so, anyone is anyone a sysadmin by like just day to day trade or? Um, so, the disaster recovery, if, if you're not familiar, so a cold site is essentially you have a location, you, you might have you know eight, you know HVAC and power kind of ran. But you probably don't have any hardware there. You probably don't have a you know a network uh, circuit online. Uh, you may have some data in transit if there was a failure, but 
Cold Sight is as bare bones as you get for a disaster recovery type situation. Warm Sight is going to hit kind of that middle ground between, you'll, you'll see the Hot Sight. Um, the Warm Sight is going to have, should have hardware in place, should have you know a network cir circuit there and, and hopefully on. You should have power and all your HVAC and all that good stuff. But data's not going to be there. Likely, you're probably going to have to carry that data in if there was a disaster. Um, also about a warm site, it's not, there's no rule of thumb necessarily, this is all kind of broad definitions, but a warm site generally will be less capacity than a normal production data center for uh, comparison on a hot site. Uh, if, you, if you don't have, you know, let's say you had 20 servers, uh, maybe you would have 10 at your warm site, just enough to sustain you from not falling over, but definitely not enough for day-to-day -day productivity. And then a hot site is really, it should be a one-to-one -one parry almost. You, you, ideally, it's the same hardware, the same configurations, same power, same everything, so that if there's a failure, the only thing you have to do is basically turn turn a key, and all the data that's staged there, everything just goes live, flip DNS, and you're good to go. Most places can't afford that. I mean, if you can think about your budget, or you know, even if you're just doing a computer lab or something, uh, you can't possibly afford a whole other computer lab in another room across the state just in case. It, it, most people can't afford that. Now, uh, anyone work for Ford Motor in any capacity? Um, in IT or? Yeah. So, um, you know, Ford, obviously, Jerwin's World Headquarters, you know, they have a whole hot site right, raring to go if that Ford World Headquarters fell over. Um, they have a secondary data center to, to do exactly that. Ford's kind of a, a good example of if you're, you know, you're in that portion category, you probably can make that leap because you can't afford not to. So, um, that's a quick overview of scenarios that you'd see um, as far as basic disaster recovery planning. Everything obviously always comes down to cost versus benefit. What can you afford and what are you going to get in return for doing that? Um, hot site, not really realistic for most people, like I said. Uh, if you have to flip over uh, one data center to the next, you can't afford not to. You know, that's your only choice. Uh, it's not going to be cheap, though. Um, warm site is a nice middle ground, and this is the option you see a lot of people implement, is that ideally they'll have some hardware, but capacity is not going to be there, the, the data transfer might be lower, uh, you know, network connections, maybe at your primary data center you have you know two, con two connections, BGP, whatever, to other data centers. At your failover site, maybe you have one network connection, you know, half the, half the gear, maybe you don't have a uh, Maybe you don't have uh, redundant switches or other you know other things that are kind of luxuries in a uh, production data center versus a, a warm site. And then a cold site's cheap as hell. <laughs> I mean, relatively speaking, it, it's it's basically uh, renting a, the building, the facility to do so, and having that on on hand if you if you have to. We're talking like a depending on the size of your company, a weeks days type scenario with cold site. We're talking a, a days less than a week for a warm site, and then uh, hours for a hot site. Generally speaking. Uh, so some of this might be obvious, but why do hot sites cost so much? So considerations, your servers, your network, your storage should be duplicated um, almost one to one. Power needs, if you have the same hardware, you're going to need the same power allocations and be running that at the same time um, because you're going to want to have that data transfer always happening so you're not going to shut all the servers down. You, some of them you might be able to. Network cost probably going to be about the same, maybe you'll skip on a few things. Uh, the other thing that a lot of people don't think of when you think of a, a hot site or, or a failover data center is that someone has to manage all this still. You know, there has to be facilities teams, there has to be people uh, you know, taking care of failures, that you know, they're making sure all these staged backups work, doing recovery tests. That, uh, that gets expensive, obviously. And just simple things like career costs. If anyone's ever worked with Iron Mountain, I mean, not, not all that cheap to do some, some, of what they, uh, <laughs> some of what they provide. So having those kick backups or whatever kind of, you know, disk disk to disk backups that you're currying and back and forth between data centers. So getting in the cloud, um, this is, and these definitions here, um, this is the NIST, I would say, tenets of what cloud computing is. Uh, I actually just gave a presentation on Wednesday about cloud computing in general with kind of a security focus. And the thing about cloud computing is there's a, there's a big disparity between going to the cloud and cloud computing. So going to the cloud could be literally putting anything off-site that you don't control necessarily, or really anything anywhere that isn't your data center. Uh, <laughs> cloud computing is a very specific subset of computing technology, of an implementation set of methodologies. So 
marketing speak has really messed things up for a lot of us in, in, uh, in IT because I spend more of my time going, no, that's not what cloud computing is, no, that's not what cloud computing is, uh, than I can actually tell people, like, here's how we're going to leverage it for you. Because they've heard so many bad Microsoft Azure commercials and you know, <laughs> other things that have polluted their mind. So uh, cloud computing really is, and if, and if it doesn't really meet these tenets, it's not cloud computing, it's pretty much the, uh, the idea here. Uh, on demand, remember, you can you can turn the key. You don't have to have someone in a data center rack a new server, plug it in, IP stuff for you. You can do that yourself. Uh, Elastic, if you want one, if you want 20, you should be able to scale, pull, you know, back and forth. Measured is a really important part because unlike if you have a server at a cola facility or a dedicated server that you're, you're renting, um, that server, you're paying a monthly lease cost to have that in the rack for your company. Measured service in cloud computing should really be, you know, not necessarily CPU cycles. No one really, you can think of it abstractly like that, but really it's runtime of a given server instance, a virtualized instance, or it could be a physical instance, frankly. Uh, virtualization is common in cloud computing, but it's not required. And if anyone tells you it is, they're liars. Um, pooled service is another huge portion because um, this gets really to the virtualization concept. Uh, now, with if, if you want to think at a different level, on Amazon is going to have mostly commodity hardware. You know, maybe boxes similar to these in, in some ways, but they pulled the resources, right? And they're, they're probably going to have a virtualization layer on top, but you're still pulling hardware, right? You know, virtualization has to have a home. So, the infrastructure, platform as a service, software as a service, those are kind of the three as a service models in cloud computing that you'll usually see. Um, those should be available with broad network access. In a lot of cases, if you rent a server, you're not going to have access to that kind of uh, ingress network access. In EC2, you actually control kind of that outside layer of network, and then you also control your, control your host layer networking from firewalls and stuff. Um, at a traditional data center, you're going to control host level. You're not going to have access to the actual network level type filtering. Excuse me. Um, so if you think about a hot site, a hot site needs resources that are ready to implement, they can scale, they provide the network access you're looking for, and uh, ideally they're going to have data at the ready, otherwise they're not really a hot site. So if you, if you look at these two things and, and you take it for um, a general comparison, what a hot site needs is a lot about what cloud computing is. So there's, there's kind of an obvious correlation there that if you have the resources in a cloud environment that can do those things, and you're looking for a hot site that has to do these things, um, you're pretty much hitting close to parity for what your needs are versus what your wants are, or I, I should say what your uh, abilities are. So in a, in a cloud hot site, and this is starting to get into the idea of what cloud is and how it really functions with, with regard to DRP, um, when you have resources in the cloud, again, you're paying for the time that that server is running, the server instance, whether it's virtual or otherwise. If you take a normal data center that, um, let's use software. Software is a pretty good company. They uh, maybe have a two hundred dollar a month server, pretty good price. You know, have heavy resources. You know, dozen gigs of RAM or something, a couple you know quad core CPUs, whatever. Um, paying two hundred dollars a month is fine for one server. Maybe you have five servers. That's a thousand a month. Now, if you want parity to that, you have to have another thousand dollars a month. Whether or not things fail, year in, year out, to have that kind of "I feel good inside, I have a plan." Um, with the cloud, specific, specifically infrastructure as a service, which is the you know operating system and cloud type of situations, um, you can start an instance, configure it, and shut it down. The time it took you to configure it maybe it was an hour. You paid uh, maybe twelve cents for that hour your bill is 12 cents. You come back because your, your environment failed at your primary data center, you start that instance back up, which is already configured, and now you start paying for as long as you keep it up until your primary data center is back. So your bill for a year, if you didn't fail, is 12 cents. Um, so 12 cents versus you know maybe $1,000 to replicate a five server soft layer is $1,000 times 12, so $12,000 versus 12 cents. The cost comparisons are pretty stark and pretty obvious on which one uh, you might want to go with. Uh, data storage, pretty cheap. You can definitely find cheaper data storage per gig values. Uh, like an rsync.net, I mean, I think they're like three or four cents a gig or something. Uh, talking about 
a integrated environment like a Rackspace Cloud or an Amazon Web Services, you might be paying a premium. I don't know why Rackspace Cloud is so uncompetitive versus Amazon, but um, it might just be demand. Uh, ten, 10 cents a gig for a lot of people is pretty reasonable, especially if maybe you run a web server company. Maybe you have 100 gigs. It's really not cost prohibitive, even if you have 100 gigs for a year, as long as you have that, that data on hand if there was a failure. If you don't lose all your customers because you paid $100 a year, you know, $120 a year for backups, that's a pretty good, you know, cost to benefit ratio there. Is that per month? Um, that, yeah, so it's 10, per, 10 cents per gig per month. Uh, a bigger savings, and, and something people don't really think about when they're thinking about just sheer cost. If you've ever had a Colo, or you, you know, um, E-Prize, we had racks at Equinix in Elk Grove, Chicago, or right around Chicago in Illinois. And I mean, those Equinix facilities, I think we had four racks, um, you know, half size cage, one network pipe, and our own networking. And we were paying around $20,000 a month for it. So um, you're not, you don't pay for the data center you know, cage, you're not paying for the power for the, for the racks, you're not doing the networking or the hardware costs. Just basic upkeep, you know, you have uh, you know your gold support for Dell for a year or whatever. Um, there's a lot of overhead costs there that in the cloud, if you're paying just for the resource and not the overhead, you actually save a lot of money there. And th another nice thing about cloud, especially, and this is getting more to the whole like cloud marketing hype, is that if you use Amazon Web Services, currently how they're implemented, you can have Northern Virginia or Northern California, or Northern Ireland, or Tokyo, or Singapore. So if you wanted to have a, maybe your, your primary data center is, you know, East Coast US somewhere, um, if for some reason, you know, someone cuts some fiber, which does happen <laughs> more often than, uh, actually one happened this week to a customer of ours. Um, you know, if you get some fiber cut, maybe you'll have your Amazon EC2 on the West Coast, but maybe you also have uh, customers in Asia that you have to worry about. Maybe you'll have another EC2 uh, in, in Tokyo or Singapore. So you can actually, using the same provider with the same methodologies, the same resources, the same plan, you can implement it across Asia, Europe, and North America, all with the same you know, basic cost. Uh, so the business case, and, and this is what I like to focus on when we work with clients and they're looking for a disaster recovery or you know, business continuity type situation. A lot of these, uh, I mean, we, we obviously have some big clients that can afford this kind of stuff at, a, at another data center, but we have a lot of clients that are, we call them a mom and pop type shop, you know, they, they have a web hosting company for the last 10 years, maybe they're like a small dial ISP in Northern Michigan or something, um, and we do have a customer like that. Um, they don't have the resources to do a full deployment to another data center, maybe they don't even have another data center around them to do a deployment to. So that, the small medium business is really kind of the whole point of this business case. Um, you know, if you have 10 or 20 servers, plus networking, plus storage, plus power, plus facility costs, you know, plus Dell Gold support, plus, you know, whatever, um, it adds up very quickly. You want to be fault tolerant, uh, maybe or maybe not, you would be surprised how few people actually have a disaster recovery plan for their 100% digital online company. It's, I, I would say the minority actually has a plan. The majority have a, well, if something fails, we'll figure it out when it happens. And it, it's a terrible attitude, but a lot of people, I think, look at the financial cost and they go, we can't think about this right now. We're just trying to stay above water right now. Fair enough. Um, for a lot of companies, especially the you know, SMB, small, medium business, losing customers isn't an option. If, if a customer wants to walk away for a good reason, it, you know, it, it happens you know, in attrition type situations. But really, you can't lose a customer because you failed. Um, that could be hugely detrimental and it probably cascades too. You get bad reviews, you get people that you know talk to other customers, you get a bunch of customers at one time that have the same problem with you, and now you've lost half your business model and you're, you're one under. And another thing about the SMB, you know, the 10, 20 server type shops, is that it's a lot easier to go to the cloud. It's a lot easier to uh, duplicate resources than a thousand box shop because there's so much less complexity to the architecture, there's so much less complexity to, you know, how do we make this leap? Um, and we'll talk about some other brief things like legal considerations. If you're a larger company, you probably have to worry about your PCI level one. If you're doing $10 million of credit card transactions, 
you're level one, and good luck getting a cloud provider level one, you know, PCI compliant, or at least a QSA to approve it. Anyways. Um, so there's a, there's other considerations, legal and, and regulatory, that a larger company really can't make this jump to a, a public cloud. So here's our scenario, and uh, I want to just implore or, or push forward that this is an actual scenario. This isn't some hype thing that I made up for that sounded good. Uh, this is a real customer. We did a real business plan for them, and you know they, they, they were very happy with the uh, the plan. So some of the numbers are, are slightly different, but so web streaming. Um, if you ever you know have your favorite, maybe not like NPR, but if you have your favorite radio station, and they're like you know go to our website and stream our station type thing, um, you know there's just kind of these guys that go, oh, hey, we'll plug this in, uh, you know, to your network, and we'll take that and we'll encode it and put it on our website and we'll host it for you for all your all your listeners. And so this guy, this guy does this out in uh, around Seattle, so, uh, in the Washington State area, and this is his entire business. He was in radio before and uh, saw that need, you know, being in radio for so many years. Like, hey, you know, I have a lot of friends. I've got a good network of people, and they need streaming. I'll be the guy to do that. So cool, pretty cool business. Um, Five servers, two hundred dollars a month. Uh, you know, two hundred dollars a month is kind of a good price point for most servers at a dedicated facility these days. Uh, you know, definitely not middle of the road, more high-end servers. Got a load balancer, three web servers, and data base server. If you're streaming content, you're really just that—that's what you need. You need something to store, uh, whether it's metadata or customer data or whatever database. And then your load balancer with three web servers <laughs> behind it. You know, pointing all that traffic and giving requests out as needed. Uh, bandwidth is obviously a little bit higher than maybe your day-to-day uh, -day company, and bandwidth is one thing I'll say for a lot of cloud providers is where you start getting cost prohibitive. Actually, uh, bandwidth costs. We'll see some numbers. It adds up quickly. If you're a small company that's maybe doing you know 10, 100 gigs a month, it's a great way to go still. But a company like this, five terabytes a month, pretty pretty big handful of data. So 167 gigs a day of a uh, bandwidth cost. Storage, you know have streamed backups, have stuff that you can uh, have listeners go through an archive and click and whatever. So 400 gigs across all the servers just kind of spread out for whatever they need. And then other kind of just basic things, uh, a couple static IPs for, you know, maybe your database server and your load balancer have static IPs for, you know, public interface, and then maybe your web servers on, are on a private network behind your load balancer, something like that. Uh, Linux servers, obviously, 8 gigs of RAM, you know, um, quad, 2 gig, two gig cores. So if, how many guys have ever done anything with Amazon Web Services? Ever done employment? Awesome. So this is, this is a, well, it's good because um, I, I'm glad I had this slide in here because it kind of breaks down some of the cost structure. It, it's not just, hey, I'm running a server in, in Linux. It's, you know, there's, there's some more to it. So uh, static IPs, obviously there's, a, if you haven't heard, there's a little bit of an IPv4 problem. So um, static IPs, if you're using it, it's completely free for you to use it. However, if you register it because you want to have it on hand, you're paying a cent an hour per IP address for holding that IP. Because obviously, with a finite number of IP addresses, you probably don't want to just be holding and hoarding these IPs for your account. There's no, no real benefit for them. Uh, storage, 10 cents a gig. Uh, 10 cents a million of uh, input-output requests. I didn't even factor that number in because it's so abstract to kind of calculate at a reasonable, in a reasonable way. So, uh, But if you have a lot of disk transactions, that might be a consideration for you. Bandwidth, uh, I think it's 10 cents a gig in, and like one, and fi maybe 15 cents uh, out, something like that. Whatever the cost average is for in and out, it's you know, um, 12 and a half cents basically per gig. So again, for a small company, you know, 100 gigs a month, not a big deal. At five terabytes a month, big deal. Load balancer. Uh, Amazon actually has their own load, load balancer. It's called a Elastic Load Balancer. They have a great lexicon of uh, you know awesome branding marketing terms. So their load balancer will basically let you take existing servers, put them behind a you know port 80 comes into these servers on port 80, and they'll handle all the rest. It's kind of a neat service, but you're paying um, what two and a half cents an hour just to have a load balancer going, and then you're paying you know. 0.8 cents, I guess, right? Um, something like that. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, my yeah. math's not my strong. It's eight tenths of a cent. Of a, of a cent. We'll, we'll go with that. 
I just multiplied it on the calculator, so who knows if my math's all wrong or whatever. Uh, but <laughs> you, you guys get the idea. It's pretty cheap for the actual load balancer. You're not really paying a whole lot for the actual load balancer data compared to the actual bandwidth cost. So bandwidth cost for just sheer bandwidth versus load balancer transfer are two costs. So if you have a load balancer, you're getting hit twice. It's like a PayPal transaction with eBay. You're getting hit like nine or 10 times. Um, and then servers, uh, there's a lot of server options. There's, I think, maybe a dozen different server options, whether you're doing high CPU, high memory, um, you know, tiny ones, cluster compute cycles. There's all, you know, all kinds of options for, uh, for Amazon. And we'll get into some of what we're going to be doing. But So here's your, uh, here's your cheap and dirty cloud disaster recovery. So a T1 micro is 1.7 gigs of RAM. And basically a, a one one uh, one core one point eight gigahertz core. Uh, the T1 micro is as low as you get. It can be a thirty two bit or sixty four bit instance. At, obviously, at sixty four bit, there's really not a whole lot of gain because you're not doing any kind of memory utilization that you need to go over that boundary. However, in a lot of environments, uh, you know, most of us are sixty four bit for anything we're doing production. So it's nice to have the sixty four bit option because you don't have to duplicate and make a thirty two bit copy of your you know OS stack and you know. All that stuff. So that's their cheapest option. We'll get to the pricing in a bit. So what I'm going to do is you can make a basically a, what's called a uh, elastic block storage bot. So think of it as more or less an external hard drive attached to a server. This volume will actually boot the OS, and then it has 500 gigs of total storage um, for everything else. Now to stage this, and this is where the uh, kind of the title of what was on the website is is having one thing to kind of rule them all, as it were. So you have your database and web server software already installed. You have all your basic configuration files for your, your, your deployment stack already installed. And then you have a basic, you know, all your data points, whether it's SQL backups, whether it's uh, all your website data, just have that synced over as a starting <laughs> point. In this case, and we'll get to why in a second, but you'll have one stack IP you need to register, and that's just going to be for the database server. Um, so here's your here's your script, and this is all obviously pseudo. We can we can talk about the details if you want, but um, you should make a script that will be staged somewhere that will make an uh, Amazon. Basically, Amazon has APIs for everything. They have command line tools. They have their own API stack that you can program with. So your script would ideally make an API call that would boot this you know really small with decent storage uh, instance online, and you're probably gonna do that once an hour. Once an hour. Is kind of a standard uh, backup procedure. Uh, you'll synchronize your files, you know, synchronize your, your SQL, all your config files, and because bandwidth is not cheap, we're, we should only do deltas, you know, do your rsync or something. Um, you know, don't do a MySQL dump every time you want all, you know, five gigs of MySQL data. Just get the differences, move the differences over, and synchronize. And then lastly, just shut it back down. Um, so you have this instance, it's kind of waiting in the wings. Every hour you bring it up, sync data again, shut it back down. So that's what the actual staging of the disaster recovery looks like. Uh, a run book, if you're not really privy or if it's just a super term, is when, when you know, uh, let's see, fecal matter gets oscillating in a device. Um, that is when you use a run book. This is, this is step by step what you should have to do if a failure occurs. And a lot of companies that have disaster recovery plans don't actually have a run book. They say, oh, just switch over to the data center, but you forget the DNS transfers, you forget uh, the config edits, you forget the IPs uh, attachments, all kinds of stuff. So in our run book, the cool thing about uh, their EBS volumes, the elastic block storage you know, volumes, are you can actually replicate them. You can take it, uh, take your 500 gig volume, snapshot it, and then make copies of your environment. So if any of you have ever like had a development testing at a production environment for maybe like a web, web posting company or a uh, software engineering firm or something, uh, you have your tiers. And a lot of times people go, well, how do I make sure that testing and dev look like production? Well, if you have this, all you do is snapshot it, copy it, and start two new instances as dev and test, and now you have full parity with production. So what that allows, excuse me, what, what that allows us to actually do is we're taking those copies of a server that has all the database config, all the database data, all the web server data, all the web server config, 
we have one server already, and we need four total. I'll get to why it's not five in a second, but um, that'll give us four total instances. Another nice thing about the EC2 model, and this is something that you can't really do in a data center, if you have a server that's low capacity, because you can only afford that for your disaster recovery, there's no way to just go, oh, I need, you know, I mean, you can to a certain extent if, if you have capacity to do so, but getting another, you know, 8 gigs of RAM in a machine, getting another two uh, quad-core CPUs in a machine is, uh, you know, you're shutting down the server, you have to get a service request in, some guy has to come in, pop some stuff in, oh, RAM was bad, sorry, come back later, do it. In the cloud, in, in Amazon EC2, that T1 Micro that we're paying very little for, and we'll, we'll, again, we'll do this cost comparison in a sec, uh, you can actually have that shut down, change it to whatever size you want, and bring it back online. So you can have a server that has 1.7 gigs of RAM, uh, you know, 1.8 gigahertz, one core processor, and bring it up to 60 gigs of RAM, and you know, eight by <coughs> quad core, whatever. So there's, a, there's an obvious transition benefit that you can have these low lead resources running, and then when you have to have the capacity, you can boost it up right away. So an M1 large versus a T1 micro, so 1.7 gigs of RAM versus seven and a half gigs of RAM, one by one eight, uh, 1.8 gigahertz, and now you have a quad basically, 1.8 gigahertz for it. So uh, I just transition, uh, essentially you're, you're quadrupling more or less uh, your, your capacity on the one server, and now we have four servers like this. So if you think back to our business case, the company that we were looking at had 8 gigs of RAM and I think 4 by 2 gigahertz cores. So this, this instance pretty much has parity with what we would have had in a production data center if we had paid $200 a month times 5. Um, so you, once you adjust your instances, you're going to want to assign your database server its static IP address that's you know been waiting there. You've got your three web servers, and again, uh, Amazon has their own load balancer service. Uh, you just say these three things are attached to this load balancer, check some boxes and you're done, it does the rest for you. DNS, always a important, an important part, always forgotten. Uh, ideally, your uh, your DNS would just be these two simple changes. You'll have a load balancer, you know, your www.blah.com has an inbound, and then your database server, so that your configuration doesn't have to be edited necessarily. If you have a host name, obviously, you can change the IP behind that host name as long as your database uh, applications point at a host name, you can just flip the switch and go to town. And then if you have alter, uh, alterations for configurations, go ahead, do them. If you have to restore rec uh, recent SQL data to the database server, go ahead, do that. And then ideally start the services, everything comes online, uh, and then have a sanity check script that just says, you know, inbound request matches this text, I get this result from this web server, blah, blah, blah. Uh, essentially, this is your entire oh crap, everything went to hell on, on that server, that data center, that rack, whatever, and you're back online in EC2. It's a pretty small run book, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward what you're doing there, and now we can see why it's uh, cost effective. <laughs> so, this is the, uh, actually, let's see if I can like, push down this or something. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> I don't care what you guys say. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's awesome. Okay, um, so this this is the monthly carrying cost. So this is the, we haven't bailed over, this is what we're paying every single month just to have a disaster recovery site on the right. And I'm not sure you guys' eyes are going straight to the total, which is basically $100 a month. So uh, your server cost and the 120 hours is because we're doing 10 minutes of server time per hour. So you bring up the server online, sync data, assuming it's about 10, hour, 10 minutes to sync data and shut it back down. You're looking at about 120 hours of actual runtime. Uh, storage costs, not, not too bad, $50 a month. Um, now, 500 gigs is being, I'm sure there's ways to probably slim that down if we really had to, but that's just the, hey, we're just gonna do this one-to-one -one kind of parity. Bandwidth costs, 250 gigs, I'm thinking is kind of the delta amount. So, depending on your web server content, depending on how many uh, radio streams you have, depending, a lot of factors go in there. But I'm thinking about 50% uh, differences every month. It's kind of reasonable for, for total uh, data transfer. Now remember, you have that one static IP that you're paying a cent an hour for, 720 hours, you pay seven bucks for. Not a huge carrying cost when you only have one, but obviously if you buy 20, it starts getting a little bit weird for uh, costs. 
And balancer data and time, we didn't have a load balancer when it's not in the disaster recovery state, so we paid no cost for that. It's completely free. And you can you can instantly bring up the balancer when you need yes. it. Yes, yeah, yep. So the uh, monthly total, just about $100 a month. That's not fudge, this is hopefully straight math. So uh, the $100 price point wasn't, you know, I didn't make things up to make $100 a month. This is just what I came up with. So if you take about $100 a month, um, just taking the five servers, $200 a month, that's $1,000 a month for normal servers. If you had duplication, that's another $1,000 a month. So you're paying essentially one-tenth a month for a full redundant parity-driven cloud provider backup for D DRP. Um, I, anyone that has a 90% cost savings would probably say that's a good, good deal. So here's the cutover for a week cost. And this is where math starts getting a little bit shady. So um, again, same, same math, but we're looking at the, the actual cost for seven full days, 24 hour operation of this disaster failure. So $435 you know, for a failover scenario. Um, the nice part is for most data centers with an SLA, if their data center goes down for a week, they're probably gonna get reimbursed. So that, that cost should probably be almost a wash depending on how they prorate your you know, your account for that. The bottom line though is that on the math that we have for our soft layer data center versus the cloud, if we continue to operate for an entire month, it would be, you know, what, 86.7% more. <laughs> the math works out pretty well there. Um, so it's not, it's cost prohibitive to run this environment 24-7, 365. However, for a failure scenario, that that, that monthly total for, um, you know, that, I actually shouldn't say monthly total, that should say a week, sorry. Um, that week total, since it's probably a wash because of your pro rate for the uh, the data center, it's a pretty good deal. Now, if you're running this and you just want to go to the cloud period, not really a good idea, right? You're gonna be wasting a lot of money. And as you can see up there, the bandwidth costs, um, and then uh, the balancer data is not so much, but the bandwidth cost is, uh, what is over 50% over compared to your server costs. So it's not, really hitting a mark for uh, cost savings. But if you think of a normal company that isn't doing you know, a, a little over a terabyte a, a week, you can see that it might be actually plausible to save money by not using software and going to the cloud to begin with. Uh, in this case, this customer specifically, it wasn't good for them. And the thing is about the cloud is a lot of people are eager to go because they read something in like Computer Week or something, and they're like, oh, the cloud. And <laughs> we have to be the, uh, the mediators that say, why do you want to go to the cloud? And then we have to talk them through, here's the benefits, here's the negatives, here's our costs, here's the block. And uh, more often than not, we tell people, don't go to the cloud. I'm a huge cloud performer. I love EC2, but did I break that? Yeah. Okay, Apple. There we go. Yeah. ABJ. Um, the, uh, the thing is that, I mean, really a lot of customers, at least the customers that want to go to the cloud, they're going to be doing a lot of bandwidth, or they're going to just be complex to, to go there. So in this case, a good thing for a cutover, not for day-to-day uh, -day operations. So let's do a, a quick review on things. So basically less than $100 a month, you have one server running part-time, and then as soon as you need capacity, within like a 10-minute window probably, and that's mostly you being a human having to do some of this if you don't have a script, um, starting up four, you know, copying that one volume three other times, starting four instances from the lowly you know, T1 micro instance to the M1 large, getting you know, quad capacity. And uh, that's just not something you can do at a data center. Even if you told them, hey, our, our data center's down with you in the East Coast, put us up in your West Coast, there is no way they're gonna do that in under 10 minutes. Uh, the, nice, the nice thing, and you can stretch this out of your budget, means you to have less server time or less you know, you know, data transfer deltas or whatever. Um, if you're hitting it every hour, your data is generally speaking going to be less than an hour old, more or less, uh, more, you know, most of the time. If you have less data, maybe you should run the sinks more often because it's not really cost prohibitive to do so. If you have more data, maybe you should think of another plan. I don't know. So twelve hundred dollars a year is essentially what that's going to come down to. And if you think of that versus what they're paying for production, one month production costs more or less. So you're, you're looking at about a twelfth of your budget every, uh, compared to your production environment every year to have a full disaster recovery site. If a twelfth of your budget every year is um, going to give you more return than losing one, one or two or three customers, 
you probably should do something like this. But I'd like to stress again that it's not cheaper to run it full time in this scenario. We're just going to have it as a failover. And there are ways to make this better. Um, so we'll go into some of those. This is the broad overview, and here's a couple, uh, a couple of things to make some vast improvements, I would say. So DNS is one of those things that no one realizes is not configured well until you have to reconfigure something, and then it's a little late. So the time that lives on DNS records, we'll have companies that their primary pr primary web servers configured for a DR scenario, and their host name coming inbound has like a like a one week time to live on the record. And you know, for a lot of customers, we'll put them usually about five minutes or less for a primary type inbound uh, hosting like that. So if you have your, your uh, essentially when you get a load balancer, you're going to get a host name. Whenever you get a host name from the Amazon, this is just a friendly tip, you should always make a, a C name to it. You should never reference an IP address specifically because that could change, but the host name will never change. It doesn't make sense because the host name has the IP in it, but if they have to fail you over somewhere, they might not move the IP address, but they'll always have your host name up to date. So if you make a C name to your load balancer, and your database uh, has a static IP address with you know, EC2, we have the one reserved. You already know what the static IP is. You already know what your load balancer host name is. You should already have your DNS staged, ready to go. And then if you have a scenario where you fail over, if you have a five minute TTL, you make the flip, your DNS records hopefully for most providers, for most people, should update rather quickly. Um, again, I'm a big public uh, proponent and uh, Configuration management is one of those things that if you're looking for parity, whenever you need parity, it's very hard as a sysadmin who's like, you know, monkey patching things and fixing things ad hoc and, you know, um, doing just break fixes a lot of the time, it's hard to always make sure you have parity. And if you're going to the cloud and you're going to have a disaster recovery, you don't want to fail and realize that, oh, hey, I forgot those 20 files that I had to copy over from this one server. So if you use something like a Puppet or a Chef or a CF Engine or whatever, uh, you can be more organized, you can have more sanity, and there's less opportunity for a failure in the event that you do, well, a second failure, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Another thing to look at, you could run a, the, the T1 micro instance, you know, 24 by 7, and set up a slave replication for SQL data. Maybe your database don't import, uh, data is very, very, very important, and you can't maybe risk losing 50 minutes, or 20 minutes, or 30 minutes. Uh, if you do slave rep replication, maybe you lose a second or two. Worst case, probably. And then make sure you use SSL, because uh, if you're going to go from uh, a data center offsite to a cloud provider, it's definitely a good idea. Auto scaling groups is, gets back to the whole idea of elasticity in cloud computing. Um, a good idea is that if you're looking to save money and you're looking to fail and not have as much cost incurred, possibly, or at least be more agile, if you fail over and you have an auto scale group, the way that auto scale groups work in, uh, in EC2 specifically, you can have a couple metrics. So you can have your custom metrics, or you can say if CPU utilization is over 80% across you know n number of nodes, add another server. If it drops below 40% utilization, take away a server. Um, or you know or other similar metrics like latency or ping times or whatever. By doing that, if you start with one web server rather than your three web servers, maybe you'll actually save a bunch of money while you're failed. And then you can, you know, scale up if you have to, and if you don't, it's all, all the better. And then here's savings for anyone that's like, yeah, no, you know, 100 bucks a month is still a little high. For me. So um, when, when we do this copying, the copy is going to make 500 gig volumes times four now, rather than, you know, one that we had at 500 gig. Not exactly the most earthly way to have an extra 500 gig just sitting around. Um, what you can actually do is just kind of do a, you know, like an ext uh, resize, uh, shrink the volume down to a smaller one, and only have capacity on maybe, let's say your your web servers each have 100 gigs of capacity that it has to have. Shrink them from 500 to 100. It's kind of a quick step to do, and you'll save overhead costs of having that storage allocated. Um, back to the auto scale group. Another thing you can do is that, you know, if you're if you're failing over and this is going to be a, a, a one and two type integration. And um, if, you have a, if you have a configuration where those web servers that we looked at that were you know, eight gigs of RAM, um, you know, four bytes, you know, two basically quad uh, CPUs, that's 
scenario might be a little bit overkill all the time. If you use T1 micro, which are the you know two gig RAM, whatever, you can actually put more of those behind your load balancer and scale up more granularly than actually having these big you know honking machines behind this load balancer. So again, if you're looking for cost savings, start with maybe two T1 micros and then branch out as you need, rather than adding huge clumps of uh, computing power. EC2 also offers uh, what are known as reserved instances. Essentially, you pay a, a year down payment of some small percentage, and you get off the top every operating month a, uh, basically, I think it's like 20% off. So you might pay 10% to, to reserve it, and then you get 20% off, so maybe like a 10% net uh, savings. So if you plan to have a disaster recovery site uh, with that going you know, for four years, you might want to get that extra 10% off the top and save a little bit of money. Uh, and again, Amazon and Rackspace Cloud, and uh, there's obviously other cloud providers, but the uh, offsite storage is still, in my opinion, a little bit high. Uh, there are other companies that you could po probably get cheaper data storage, and then it may add latency to have to sync that data. But a lot of these pipes, the, the getting back to the broad network access that cloud computing should have, a lot of these network pipes, I mean, I, I can do 13, 14 uh, megabytes a uh, second type transfer with a lot of these hosts. So if you need the capacity and you're only transferring, you know, maybe a couple, you know, 20, 30 gigs, it may actually be uh, a good idea to do that. So who's this good for? The, the client or your own life that has a, maybe a business need or just a personal need that you don't want to have failures that are just offline, I can't do anything, my hands are tied, but they don't have a, a great budget to really manage. A big thing, and I, I brought this up briefly, if you're going to have cloud computing in a public cloud, which is what like an Amazon or a Rackspace is going to be, um, if you're doing, and this goes to a bigger topic, but you know, the PCI compliance is probably the hardest one to really match. Um, there are people that are PCI compliant in the cloud. There are people that are HIPAA compliant in the cloud. Um, I heard a story about people monitoring EKG machines from an Amazon EC2 instance. I, you know, all kinds of things happen in the cloud. Um, you can do things within regulatory confines. However, sometimes it's cost prohibitive to go through the process to do that. You know, being, being PCI compliant based on your own opinion and being PCI compliant with someone telling you and certifying you, the amount of money there can be uh, very different. You know, an IT staff, obviously, or, or your own self, has to be comfortable within these cloud providers. You know, they have their own terms. They have their own uh, payment method or uh, payment, you know, measuring. Uh, there's a lot of considerations that if you're just getting into a cloud provider, you have to learn before you implement. Because if you try to double back and go, oh, I didn't think of this. I didn't think of the bandwidth cost. I didn't think of this. I thought I was just paying for my instance. Um, if you don't have a good basis on what you're working with, you might actually end up losing money than, than making a, a good investment. And another thing is, and I'll finish up briefly with a slide, but if you're looking to still get into actual cloud computing, not marketing hype cloud computing, uh, this is a great scenario that maybe you have, again, your one server that maybe you host friends and family and maybe a couple business accounts on. This can be a model that you can implement, and this is a good reason to try out cloud computing to get your feet wet, because it has a purpose it's relatively cheap, and you get to utilize a lot of the cloud computing components. Um, and this is, I, I sort of, I don't work for Amazon, I just really like Amazon. <laughs> um, if you're looking to do that, and your business needs are there, I'll put all these up. Um, there we go. If you're a new AWS customer for the first year, um, the 700 750 hours is enough to do a full year, 24 by 7 running of an EC2 instance, so one instance. Um, 750, 750 hours and 15 gigs of data processing, uh, 10 gigs of storage, and essentially, well, with a load balancing that is 15 gigs of bandwidth in and 15 out. So if you want to do what I talked about in the last like 40 minutes or so, you can do that for free for a year. Um, now, obviously, if you're doing five terabytes of data, you're, you're going to be paying for the data. The nice thing about this plan, how they've worked it out, is if you go over, you just pay the normal day-to-day -day charges. So you can have all of that for free, and then if you had to, um, you know, have more bandwidth, maybe you can just pay for the bandwidth you're, you're using in, you know, in lieu of what you're 
basic plan is. So um, if you're still looking to get into the cloud computing, if you want to you know, jump in with both feet, you can do it for free. And there's, uh, you know, when it's free, it's <laughs> not, a lot, not a lot of reason not to. So um, that's kind of the, uh, the conclusion of that. Um, obviously, this isn't directly Linux-centric if you're doing other things with uh, I mean, they support you know NetBSD now, FreeBSD, uh, obviously Windows is supported. So if you're doing different things for different clients, maybe you're a Linux user but you have business needs that are Windows or otherwise, you can still jump in with the same kind of thoughts, just maybe in a slightly different way. Um, I, don't, I only work with Linux in the cloud, so I can tell you about them. But uh, so, anyone have any questions about that, or want to know any more about the Linux side of things with the cloud or EC2 or yeah? Uh, we have uh, a server here that we tried using as uh, like a video conferencing big blue button. And the problem we came into is that just the bandwidth out of the building. Yeah, yeah. my bandwidth here is really low, so we can get three megabits down and uh, five twelve. up. And and that sounds like an American tech ADSL from like <laughs> 1999. That's amazing. It is an American tech <laughs> 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 So my thought was, you know, if we were to to set up an, an Amazon EC2 instance and run the big blue button for four or five hours a month. Yeah. You know, I think that would go good. I mean, is that something that you think? Yeah, do you, um, I mean, do you have a guesstimate of how much bandwidth you would transfer in that couple hours? Yeah, about, about zero button? with the current, you know, current <laughs> participation that we get. <laughs> I mean, if we got it running good, then we'd get more people on there. But I think it was like per hour, it was something like, I want to say five gig bandwidth per hour or something like that. Okay. Per user? No, total. For how many users? I forget um, what the big blue button website is. I'd have to look it up. I can't remember the now, but it, it was something around. It, it was that was, you know, that was probably for fifty users. Oh, well, that's fine. Yeah. Wow. Well, so both Big Blue Button, you can do like the they did a test, 197 users at a time. Right, but for, but how many, how much data are you? Because it's it's video web conferencing. Yeah. Yep. you're moving it's a lot of data. Right. Even you're not storing any. It's on the weekly. I'll look it up. I mean, what, what do you think for that bandwidth? I think I think as a starting point, I mean, um, do, you, do you have basic uh, like CPU and RAM requirements? Uh, two gigs of RAM and. I thought it was three. I thought they recommended three, but we only had two on our server. No, they, they recommended two. Works good with four. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for the T1 micro might be a little underpowered for that. You know, I'm just thinking of a free angle for that. Um, but for free, it wouldn't hurt us to try it for a month. No, that's and that's definitely true. And if it worked well, you could always shut down that instance that, that that's the low end, start back up at the higher capacity for the hours that you're using it as a actual streaming mechanism, and then lower it back down for your day-to-day -day maintenance and upkeep of the server if you, if you want. Which there really isn't any. So yeah, you, you could just, you could just it shut off. it down. Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always about you know how much are you willing to spend, but I think that it probably would, would hit a pretty decent price point to be feasible. I mean, do you think I what? I guess I can look this up, but do you think that'd be twenty dollars a month to do that, or less? Or um, yeah, and it's one time for like if you're doing maybe yeah, five this meeting we would be okay doing it for this meeting. So like I, I think I think twenty would be reasonable. I, you might even be able to do more like ten, but yeah, okay. I, I, and if you're I doing the free really tier, it's like you know just bandwidth. You might pay what. 30, 40, uh, like 50 cents or something obscene? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. so, and, and the nice thing is, uh, it, it's really easy to jump into Amazon too. It, a lot of it's a web console. I, you know, I talked about the API and the command line tool. Some of that, for some of you, that might be the way to go, but they do have a whole web console where you log in, you see all these public images, um, and you say, oh, I want, you know, Ubuntu, I want, um, you know, uh, CentOS, I want whatever. Just click on it, start instance, and it boots up and you SSH in and you're, you're logged in. And, I mean, um, it, the what kind of control do you have? Can say, I'm sure they have Debian, right? So I say, um, I say, I want to run a Debian instance. Then when I log in, can I modify my sources.list so that when I, if I do an app get update, yeah. I'm now running what the, the sources I want instead of the standard Debian sources. So, so the cool thing is, um, has anyone done Zen virtualization or any kind of virtual KVM Zen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so EC2 runs kind of their own modified Zen. So really, the cool thing is, uh, anyone use PVGrub? 
Okay, so PV grub, the cool thing about that is it, it's, it stands for para virtualization grub. Um, previous, like maybe a year ago, you would boot a kernel based on the kernels that were either uploaded by someone uh, that was built for EC2 or uploaded by Amazon. With PV grub, you can actually boot uh, a stock kernel in the cloud and then load your own kernel for your actual OS. So you have kernel and user land control of everything. There's really nothing you don't have direct control of for the operating system level. Um, you can have from, I think, five gigs to a terabyte of volume storage. So if you want 20 gigs, you can have 20. If you want 40, you can have 40. And if you want to in increase it, you can increase it. Um, so yeah, you can you control everything. You boot an OS and you do it like it was just a, on that computer. That's that's pretty yeah. So I found the calculations. It says for 30 users, it's 4.3 an hour. Or 4.3 yeah. gigs an yeah. hour. Gigs an hour. If you uh, Google for a AWS calculator, Amazon actually has their own calculators to do price yeah. points. Yeah. Um, yeah, they make it pretty easy to figure out, hey, this is yeah, a good idea. Yeah, we can do that for idea. 20 bucks a month. I'm willing to come up with five. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm thinking it's going to be somewhere around 10. Cause if we're, and we're really not doing updates or anything. We'll just crank it up you know, before the meeting starts. Yeah, and then before the meeting starts, or 15 minutes before the meeting starts, crank it up. Yeah. And we can just want our, rep, our website off of this. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, so I, uh, not exactly a direct comparison, but I have a T1 micro reserve instance. I think I paid ten dollars, like ten or twelve dollars or something to reserve it. And then uh, over the year, I would say I just run a, a website at one of their product now. And uh, you know, I run a web server, I run some other applications, and it's like thirteen dollars a month maybe to run to run my website to run you know a full. Uh, I have a it, it's basically a central web server, and you know, works works just fine. So. Cool. And for uh, you know, for most people, just getting getting on there and having something available, you know, a lot of us could always have like, oh, hey, I need somewhere to transfer this file to temporarily, or I need someone, or I need a place that my friends can log in and play Tetris, or you know, whatever you want. Um, you know, doing it for free for a year is a pretty good way to see I like this, I don't like this. So maybe even if you don't have a business case, at least jump on and see. Any other questions, Linux related to it, or just general DRP? Yeah. So, um, how does Amazon make money off this? And how does they make? Do you have any idea? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I, I don't know how much they're making. Um, the I, I think supply demand is probably <laughs> so they have a lot of commodity hardware and very cheap hardware that they expect to fail and. You know, using virtualization, being very efficient with their resources, they uh, they seem to be doing okay though. That's for sure. Well, this is probably like uh, advertising, trying to get you involved so that you're doing it for the free. You find, oh, I could probably spend this. Then you do the twenty dollar a month thing, and then then you're onto a hundred dollar, and you're you know, it's like crack. You know, right? they give you free crack the first couple months. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the the free tier actually started like. I don't know, maybe December. So it's actually a relatively new thing. Um, I, I wish it, it had been around when I started on it, for sure. But the nice thing was I was doing it for a company, so I could just play with it as much as I felt inclined to do. So, so what, is the what is it they give you for free? How much bandwidth? Yeah. and? Oops. The uh, calculator just told me $2.35 per month for just running it for the five hours. No way. 25 you, you get gigabytes. Gigabytes. Did you get your bandwidth in there? Yeah, I put 25 data transfer in and out. I put 25 for each. Five gigs good. in and out. And 230. So we could we could pay for that with a pop money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have found our big blue button server. <laughs> <laughs> so and then that'll hold our instance. So all I do is like turn it off. Like even when it's turned off. Your overhead cost for the carrying cost, as it were, is the volume storage. So um, how much how much data storage do you think you need total? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm in the server right now. I'll tell you what we have. Your SSH in? Yeah. We okay, are. So there's no data there at all. It's just this. We're currently using 
five gigs, I think. But if we start recording. Yeah, that'll move it up. I mean, maybe a hundred. But then we take. take I don't know that we want to. I don't know that we want to record. Okay, but if we do record, we could just pull that data right off, like right at the end of the meeting, right? Yeah. And that's what I'd recommend, honestly. Um, Again, the the storage and and bandwidth is the server time is actually really relatively cheap compared to the other metrics. Um, You know, five hundred gigs of storage, around fifty dollars a month, right there. Yeah. It's like it's kind of like. Cherry picking. They, no, they yeah. expect to make their money off of the data storage, is what it looks like to me. That's and what and the bandwidth, yeah. Is that yeah. per the actual data you have on there, or your volume size? You, yeah, you, you dictate the volume size because essentially that is uh, that is reserved space for you. Yeah. So that means another customer can't have it. So essentially you decided to own it for that. Yeah. Okay. So if we drop that down to like 10 gigs or something. Then. Yeah. 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 Pretty cheap, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think I think I have like a, a ten gig volume of mine or something. Just, um, it's it's one of those things that if you if you think about your use case and you cut costs where it makes sense to cut costs, you can make it really cost. You know, you know, you, it, it's a great scenario for a lot of companies. But a lot of people go to the cloud, do the same things they did in their data center with all their disk arrays, and and they just blow money because yeah. they didn't think about what they were doing. And uh, you know, if you take some time and go, yeah, we can move this off site, you know, put it on, you know, another server that costs two cents an hour or you know, a month or something for a gig, you're it's pretty cheap. So mm-hmm. what, oh, so others, what were those other two? R Sync what for the data? Uh R R Sync.net. R Sync.net. Yeah. Yeah, we have a customer or a couple customers that use that. Because like yeah, that's what I'm tasked with here is just getting uh, the uh, the data off like a data off site back. So They're a good one, and you can just. And can I can I just do an R sync tool? Yeah, I, or, <laughs> yeah. Or, or just like FTP some data over whatever you're you know looking to accomplish. So. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh Th- yeah, it was a great presentation. Thank you. Great.